Welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman, a podcast loaded with practical tips, powerful scripts, personal stories, and simple steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. So get ready to get the information you need to make the impact you want from someone you trust, your friend, parenting expert, Dr. Robin Silverman. Hello and welcome to How to Talk to Kids About Anything, where we give you the tips, scripts, stories, and steps to make even the toughest conversations easier. I'm so honored to be your host, Dr. Robin Silverman, child and teen development specialist, author, and speaker, and most importantly, parent of two great kids who keep me learning, loving, and growing every single day, whether I want to or not. Believe me, I get it. It's not always easy, but as you know by now, we're in this together, and we've got some wonderful people helping us along the way. Thank goodness. Now, have you ever seen an ad for a toy, movie, TV show, or book and wonder, is this right for my kid? Wish you had known from a completely unbiased, well-researched, independent, child-focused organization how to pick the best apps, best websites, best educational videos for your kids at the most optimal ages. And speaking of optimal ages, wish you knew how much screen time your child should get or when you should get your child his or her first phone, then you have come to the right place today. Parenting in the 21st century is filled with figuring out media from dealing with online safety to navigating social media to knowing which apps are really good for learning. We are so thrilled to have Caroline Noor from Common Sense Media, the nation's leading nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of kids and families by providing the trustworthy information, education, and independent voice that they need to thrive in the 21st century. As Common Sense Media's parenting editor, Caroline helps parents make sense of what's going on in their kids' media lives. From games to cell phones to movies and more, if you're wondering what's the right age for my child to do this, that, or the other thing, Caroline can help you make the decision that works best for your family when it comes to media. She has more than 20 years of editorial and creative marketing writing experience and has held senior level positions at walmart.com, Walmart stores, CNET, and Bay Area Parent Magazine. Magazine. She specializes in translating complex information into bite-sized chunks to help families make informed choices about what their kids should watch, play, read, and do. And she's the proud mom of a teenage son whose media passions include Star Wars, StarCraft, graphic novels, and the radio program This American Life. Now, if you have questions for Caroline, she invites you to email her, and the email address is right in the show notes of this podcast on drrobinsilverman.com. There is so much to learn about media and kids today. We are so grateful you are here. Welcome, Caroline Noor, to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Hi there. Hi there. Thanks for coming. We're glad to have you. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Well, we've got a lot to cover. Before we get into the meat of the matter, for those who haven't had the opportunity to meet you or see your work on Common Sense Media's website, would you just take a moment to tell us what gets you up in the morning and what got you so interested in media, children, and teens? Uh, well, let's see. What gets me up in the morning? You know, I really feel like I really do want to help parents navigate the world of media and technology. Um, I really got started doing it um, much more sort of focused on websites and, you know, uh, educational websites and how parents could find great um, sites for learning because uh, a lot of sites say that they're educational, but they're not really. Mm -hmm. And then as social media really moved into um, our lives, I really got more involved in it and realized, and then, and then kids started doing it. Um, and then I really realized um, that parents just are really adrift um, because they didn't grow up with this media technology or this, they, they didn't grow up with um, the this kind of all encompassing 24 right. seven, you know, media world that kids are living in today. And, and um, I do have a background in uh, childhood development and, what I really love about Common Sense Media is that we try and integrate our advice based on childhood development guidelines. So, so what that means is knowing that you know when kids are you know 
around the toddler and preschool age, what they're really focused on doing for, you know, their best um, development is socializing, um, you know, learning from parents and that kind of stuff. So that helps us give great advice to parents because then we can say, you know, you don't need to use media because there's not necessarily a lot of studies that prove that kids can learn from media better than from parents. Right. And yet parents are in a world where they're getting marketed to all the time about the great benefits that technology can bring to their kids, you know, learning. So, so we, so a common sense media, we really try and, um, help parents sort of sift through a lot of the marketing and a lot of the just information that's out there and try and get to what's real and true to really help their kids grow and thrive optimally in this sort of crazy world that we're living in. So that's great. So, so I think initially I would love to know from you, how does a parent decipher what kids, their kids should or shouldn't be watching or consuming in terms of media? How does one even put that into their head and figure out what is important to me and how do I deliver that to my child? That's a really, really important question because so much does depend on your own value system. Yeah. Um, and that's why at Common Sense Media, we always say um, it is really based on your family's values and what you want to pass along to your kids. And also really understanding your kids' temperament and their interests um, and sort of where they're at um, in their particular development. Um, you know, there's these childhood development guidelines that are very broad and kids break them all the time. Um, you know, kid, you know, some kids are reading at three, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So I do believe that it is important for parents to kind of go through that exercise. You know, it's good to do this with your, you know, with your, with the, your spouse, your, your significant other, your partner, whoever. Because media and technology are so pervasive, we do need to figure out what our values are around these things. And I'll just give you an example. Um, so you can say, well, one of my values is honesty, mm -hmm. let's say. <laughs> um, then you can you can use that as a kind of a uh, one of that's, that could be your North Star. And that could be, well, I'm looking for media that um, that that supports that value. That's mm -hmm. something I'm going to pass along to my kids. So that will help you decide, well, when it comes to social media, what I want to teach my kids is the most important thing is you just got to be honest. You got to be yourself, you know, do, be authentic. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. so, you, so you can just use that as a guideline um, to choose media that supports your family's values. And then, and then you can say to yourself, when you're sifting through all of the media and technology choices, you can say, well, does this media support my values or does it not support my values? And if I'm watching this media or I'm interacting with this media with my kids, how can I use it to support that value? And it could be any any uh, value that, that is important to you, love, um, tolerance, you know, persistence. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's we, we do a big thing about character strengths at Common Sense Media. So you can even start with, a, with the 11 character strengths that we've identified to be some of the most important things to raise your kids with. So I believe that sort of figuring out what your values are and what you want to pass down because you can find so much media that supports that. And then you can strengthen that over time. Mm -hmm. That will help you weed out the stuff that does not support your values. I like that. I think that's important. And I also agree with you about knowing your child's temperament. I mean, even your own. I can't stand anything that's violent. It gives me nightmares. And my child, one of them, is the same. The other one's completely different. Couldn't care less about violence. But, you know, I... I know how sensitive I am even to suggested violence. So for me, I would want to know if, you know, if that was relayed in any media. But I also like the idea that, you know, you go, you can go by a character term. I, I teach a curriculum. I write a curriculum called Powerful Words, and it's all about character and teaching character to kids. And many of the people who are listening today also uh, help to bring that that curriculum to light to all the kids. And, you know, I think it's important for people to be able to hear that it doesn't need to just be in curriculum form that they're, you know, talking to their kids about 
honesty or perseverance, determination, tolerance, or any of the other words that you may have mentioned, um, but also that they can they can choose media that either supports that or make sure they don't choose media that actually is very counter to it. But I'm wondering if your child is watching something or has watched something that is counter to what you wish they had watched and they come home and they've said to you, I watched this at a friend's house. What What is it that you can say to them or do in that circumstance when you know that you've said in the past, I don't want you watching that kind of stuff? Right. And I believe that that's really the second step of that original question that you asked me, because as you know, we're going to be getting into a world where kids are going to be exposed to you know, stuff that's age inappropriate, stuff that doesn't match your values, stuff that, you know, uh, is, um, is, is potentially harmful uh, to their well being or really is, um, you know, some kids with a sensitive temperament might be really uh, upset about certain things, they're gonna encounter that stuff. Of course. And, and, you know, we, a lot of parents are like, well, I'm going to use parental controls, or I'm going to just ban it all. And you just, it's just not possible mm -hmm. to do that, given that we have kids going to school with cell phones, you know, even in like elementary school. So your kid is going to become exposed to those things. And so what I say to that is, you know, you really can't ban, you have to have a plan. Mm, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good um, little uh, rhyme to just have a reminder that um, banning is is not going to work, even, even if your family's values are very... Um, uh, sort of um, anti-media or, mm -hmm. you know, anti-technology. Uh, like get a lot of parents who write to me and say, well, I don't even want my kid to have cell phone. That's fine, but they're going to get exposure. So what you want to do is you want to, uh, I believe that you want to approach your kid's media um, with um, non-judgmentally mm -hmm. because, and then the other thing is especially especially when kids are younger, but as they get older too, they're always testing. And they're always really trying to figure out where that line is that is this okay for me or not. And they are absolutely looking to you, even if they've done something against your wishes, or they know you're going to disapprove. If they're telling you that they watched it or played a violent video game or something that they know you're not going to like, they are looking to you to tell them what you think of that and that informs how they think about it even mm -hmm. if it doesn't feel that way um especially as kids get into the tween and teen years when they're starting to individuate and become more independent if they're telling you they're doing something they are looking to you to provide guidance on that and that's what's so challenging in this 24 7 media world so what I do say is, and I had this experience with my son when he, you know, he loved Star Wars as a, uh, I still love Star Wars, um, but he watched, you know, he went to someone's house who had, you know, different media values mm -hmm. than, I, than I have, and that happens a lot too. So he went to someone's house, had a sleepover, and watched like a bootleg copy of, you know, one of the most violent Star Wars movies oh. when he was like in first grade. Oh, no. <laughs> right. So this was a family that had an older, yes. you know, kid at the house who liked this stuff. And, the, you know, they like that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is going to happen. So I didn't approach it as like, well, you were wrong to do it or, or yell at the mom or whatever. You know, really what I said was, well, how did you feel when you watched the movie? Bingo. Did beautiful. Did you like the movie? What's that? I said bingo. It's just so good to, to, to use that question about how they felt about it to get their feelings before you react. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, again, very hard to do as a parent when you're in the moment of feeling emotional and, and angry or whatever, upset. You have to take a, a breath and, and ask them open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. Get the information from them, and then you kind of know what you can react to. So... What I can say about that is, well, I don't like you watching, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like you're not, you know, ready for this type of violence um, in the show. Um, you know, next time when you're at someone's house, you know, you can tell them that your mom doesn't really want you watching, you know, violent stuff because it can give you nightmares um, or something like that. So you can also put a little responsibility on your kid 
to let the people in charge know or whoever, uh, that helps the kid draw a line for themselves as well. And it gives them a little bit of cover because they can say, well, my mom says, right. you know, it's just like, blame you, it you know, on you. I, yeah, exactly. When I was little, I wasn't allowed to eat sugar when I went over to somebody's house. <laughs> so guess what I did? Right. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so I think that you really want to try and get those, get your kid to um, open up to you and embrace their media positively, positively because kids really do like media and technology. They are looking to media and technology for cues on how to behave and how to act. It's, it really acts as a kind of super peer to kids as uh, for uh, guidance on, you know, really what, you know, they should be like and what they should expect from mm -hmm. themselves and their friends. So, um, so they, so to, if they feel like you're disapproving, they may not be as open about sharing it with exactly. you. And what you really do want is to get that conversation going. Right. And mm -hmm. it, whatever movie, video game, whatever it is, at Common Sense Media, we offer families talking points, three to four talking points about every single piece of media that we review. And mm -hmm. we do that because we absolutely believe that even if it's something, again, that doesn't support your family values, it's not a, you know age appropriate, especially if it kind of is counter, these give you the talking points to talk it through with your kid and get them to open up to you about how they feel about it. And then during those conversations is the time when you can impart your values to them. And, and even if you think, uh, I don't know if they got it, they are getting it at, with every single conversation that you have. They're absorbing your messages, which will, which they will factor in as they're getting the media messages. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with that. And uh, it's great to have those types of tough conversations being open and understanding that you may wind up with different media values than your own child, but at least they're hearing what yours are. And they know that your voice is still there in their heads when they're making decisions later on. I like that. That's right. One it's of the most important things I think too is, um, what you said about kids not necessarily having the same media values that you have. That's mm -hmm. super challenging. Um, a lot of boys are really into video games. They They're, are. And, you know, it is more boys than girls. Mm -hmm. uh, girls are more into kind of social media. That's what the statistics say. But with, with video games, you know, if you're not a gamer, it's kind of hard to relate to what your kids are doing. And it all looks kind of uh, mystifying and scary and aggressive on the screen. But um, the studies show about video games that that kids, when they're playing them, are actually learning things. Um, they are picking up um, strategic skills. Mm -hmm. They're picking up executive functioning skills. Uh, that's the ability to think through the consequences of their actions. They are learning those skills. They are also learning collaboration and communication because they're typically playing against another you know, human being. And they have to work together or they have to not work together. But there's a lot of, you know, even communication going on. So if you can, if the, you know, I know a lot of parents are thinking with video games about the time limits. They go, oh, well, you can only play a half an hour of video games a day. I think parents need to change that concept into thinking about it more as a, as the qualitative experience that your kid's getting from it. Mm -hmm. If they're interested in it, they're learning from it in some regard. So try and, you know, you can put the time limit on it, but you can also, what, I, what I've always done, even ever since my son, son was little, and I learned this trick about how to handle transitions. I go up to him and I, if I want him to transition, even whether it was playing blocks or whatever, I would go up and say, what are you building? Well, tell me about this project. What do you, you know, what, it, what, what's that? Oh, you did a nice job. You know, so you engage with them and talk to them about what they're doing mm -hmm. and then you can transition them off. Mm. That, that works with husbands too. Um, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> but with kids playing video games, you can say, oh gosh, what's that? Well, tell me about this game. Kids really like to be in the driver's seat and they like to be explaining things to their parents starting around the tween years. They want to they want to, um, you know, share their knowledge with you. And if you approach it with curiosity and ask them what they are getting at, you know, tell me about this game. Then again, you can start these conversations and that will lead you into a conversation 
if you're not into the violence, you can talk to them about that as well. Mm, so there's many times that we can get into these types of conversations. I was interested in one of the things that you said where you were talking about in, in certain times, you know, don't worry so much about this, the amount of screen time, but remember that they might be getting something out of their time on the screen. What I, that sounds like a possible mis, you know, mistake that, that parents might make not knowing. So what are some other common mistakes that parents might make when addressing uh, a child's screen time? So I think that parents assume that if their kids are watching it, they're going to imitate everything that they see on the screen, mm -hmm. uh, which of course is not true. Um, I had some, you know, kids do go through an imitative phase, um, you know, when they're sort of a preschool age, you know, they do see something on screen that they want to imitate. But as, but, um, as kids get older, um, you know, screen entertainment is, it, it's entertainment. So, you know, like, for example, I love to watch The Real Housewives of New York. Like, <laughs> that's because it's a cathartic experience. But you're not me. imitating them? <laughs> <laughs> well. Because I'd like to mind. see that. <laughs> uh, right. And so, you know, so they're absorbing a lot of different messages that they're that they're watching. So I I do think that um, parents make the mistake of like again, yeah, if they're, if they're watching the show, then that's what they want to be. That's what they aspire to be. And um, I think we can engage with them uh, more about um, the content on the screen mm -hmm. than just you know put those limits. And I and like I do believe that. The limits are important. Um, the studies all show that there's no there. The studies don't have like an exact time limit mm -hmm. after which point media is bad for you. They basically just show like too much is too much, um, and that's because it can lead to some negative outcomes. For example, uh, you know sedentary lifestyle. It can also lead to you know social withdrawal, uh, some unhealthy habits, and also. It, for very young kids, screen uh, stuff can interfere with a parent-child relationship. Sure. So you do want to impose screen limits. But you do need to also understand that if kids are interested in something on the screen, it may not be um, realistic to impose a, okay, you got to stop net right now because they may be engaged and interested in something that they're seeing on the screen and that no, no, that 30 minute time limit is going to interrupt that. Right. Um, so especially with video games, I always say to parents, you know, uh, you do want to set a time limit, but do understand that kids need to perhaps uh, have a moment to save their game, um, say goodbye to the people they're playing with. Uh, you know, remember it's interactive. Right. So um, I think. I think the mistake is that parents just maybe don't realize that there's a qualitative experience happening that, you know, in an optimal environment, you want to be able to get your kids talking about it. Good points. Good points. So if we move from talking about TV for right now and video games to phones, which I know are on a lot of people's minds, what would you say is the best age for kids to get their first phone? And how would you know if your child was ready or not ready for their phone? Yeah, a lot of parents start thinking about getting their kids' phones when their kids are even as young as nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, we're already fact, hearing about it. My child's eight yeah, and a half, so we're already hearing about it. That's right. Um, but of course, um, there's a lot of capabilities that the phone has that are really just not age appropriate for you know a nine year old. So, but one of the things that we at Common Sense Media, what we say is it really is more important to uh, look at your family's needs and also look at um, the maturity level of your kid and what type of um, behaviors that they've demonstrated so far that might indicate that they are capable of handling the responsibility of a very powerful and expensive piece of equipment in their hands. Um, so what I say is, you know, is your kid capable of following directions? Are they capable of doing what you say? Are they pretty good about, um, you know, uh, if you say I need you to check it, you know, so if they go to a friend's house and you say I need you to check in with me when you get there, can they do that? Mm -hmm. um, you want to have some um, demonstration 
that um, they are going to follow your rules and that they're going to be responsible with it. Um, all of the things that lead to a kid's responsibility, can they take out the trash? Can they you know, do things independently? But for most kids, it's going to be a little bit later because not a nine-year-old kid doesn't necessarily have uh, really great executive functioning skills. Again, the, the ability to think through the consequences of their actions. And with phones, you really need that because you can you know, put stuff out on the internet on, in public, um, you know, just with a few taps. And, and kids who are nine just really can't understand that concept because, because they're still not great about even thinking abstractly. Mm -hmm. um, sure. So that's another thing you want to be able to say, well, do you understand when you put something up on the internet, it is public and it's going to, you know, tons and tons of people, mm -hmm. not just friends. So I think you want to look at that. And then I do think that one of the values of having cell phones is that kids can be independent. And we're living in a world where kids' independence really gets restricted um, because, uh, you know, we can, we're keeping our kids home more. And we're also in charge of our kids' schedules more, um, you know, than we used to be. In, I agree with that, yes. Years ago. So what I really like about a, a younger kid, maybe a 10 or 12 year old having a having a cell phone is that they can get from A to B independent and you know they can text you or you can text them or you can follow them on a you know GPS and know where they are and so mm -hmm. that does lead your kid into having some independence which is a which is great um, but again they need to be able to demonstrate that they right. can use it responsibly. I um, actually had that moment where yeah. I realized that because I had the cell phone and my daughter did not, I was making her play date arrangements for her. She'd be right. like, can I play with so-and-so? And then I would text the mom and I was like, this is not what I want. I want my child to be able to ask a question, you know, make, use a phone, use a, <laughs> call somebody <laughs> yeah. up and, and do what we used to do. And, and so of course, you know, we started talking about that and I talked to some of my friends and I said, I'd really like my daughter to be able to do that. Is it okay if she is the one who starts calling you and asking to speak to her friend in the same way that we used to? And so I wrote down on a piece of paper, you know, okay, here's, here's the kind of thing you can say. And actually she wrote it in her own handwriting, but it was, you know, hello, Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, this is, and she gives her, gives her name, um, how are you? <laughs> so I said, you have to acknowledge the person who actually answered the phone and then say, um, can I please speak to so-and-so because I was wondering if she might be available for a play date. And she's been doing it. And I think it's so important. So I see on the one hand, you know, the, the challenge of, I don't want to give my child this piece of equipment so early, but I also see the value of making sure that we're not taking, we're not taking away that independence. We're actually still building on their ability to make this happen in their lives. And they're not so dependent on us for a skill that really they should be exhibiting at that age. I absolutely agree. And I also would just add that parents need to be um, tolerant of that learning curve that kids are going to go through when they do start making their own plans and really treat that as an educational opportunity for, um, you know, understanding schedules, mm -hmm. <laughs> understanding, okay, who do I need to ask if I'm available for this time? Because I mean, when kids start making their own plans, they go crazy. They're like, yeah, just come over. Yes. Like, not <laughs> my mom or dad are sure they can take me over. Yeah. No problem. Right. So they're bad at it usually. And, um, <laughs> and so Frankly. we need to coach them through how to do that. Absolutely. So what I recommend for parents is um, I, I do think that elementary school is pretty young. And it's partly because, um, again, kids are just they're clumsier, you know, they'll drop the phone, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're distractible, they'll lose the phone. Um, you know, they also just don't understand that they, that the phone um, can be, they don't necessarily understand if they're misusing the phone and hurting others, right, right. potentially harming their own reputations by posting something on the internet. Um, 
it, they're still very uh, vulnerable in those social areas. So I do say middle school is a good time. And then um, I do think that parents, uh, I really, really wish that there was a great uh, phone option for kids um, instead of just every kid wants an iPhone. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you can give them the iPhone, but then you can actually um, either uh, delete or hide or restrict a lot of the functionality of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can you can t you can use the restrictions in the iPhone to turn off a lot of the a lot of things that um, could get kids into trouble. Mm -hmm. And what I say is, you know, keep everything except for the texting. You know, you can turn off the data plan uh, so they can't get on the internet. You know, so you can mm -hmm. turn off a lot of stuff and and have them earn the responsibility once they demonstrate uh, really good um, you know digital citizenship and 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 show that they can follow your rules and the school's rules. So. If you give your child a phone or now they're able to watch certain videos or they're able to do some video games, how do you then manage their screen time without having a tantrum or a conflict or a blowout when they're like, wait a second, I want more and we have to leave or, you know, you've said it's enough or you say you're not ready for a phone and they you know, they really have a bad reaction to that. How do you manage that? Right. That's really, really, really hard um, because once they get the phone, it's like their personal property and they think that they have the control over it. So what I really recommend is if you get a phone or even if you get your kid their own you know, tablet or right, you know, laptop right. for school yes. or whatever, um, I think that you should roll that out with a family media plan. Mm hmm. Oh, I like the family <laughs> media plan. Yeah. Uh, actually, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a great um, media plan worksheet that you can use on their website. Um, Excellent. I'll put that as a, a link on your show notes. That's perfect. Oh, great. Yeah. And um, sort of age appropriately through. Uh, what kids are going to need in terms of uh, for schoolwork or if they have a club or, or anything that they do need the phone as a utility uh, in order to accomplish. Sure. Their or the tablet for school. Sure. Exactly. Yeah. So and what's so important is to get kids um, not even their buy in, but try and allow them to lead that conversation of like, well, when do you think that you're going to want to need to be on the phone? Mm -hmm. How much time do you want just for for socializing with your friends? How much time do you want for, for gaming? Um, how do you want me to help support you in managing and self-regulating? Mm -hmm. I just can't stress enough how important it is for us to give kids the tools and I to self-regulate. And I really like some of the new um, parental controls that are coming out that put kids in the driver's seat of managing their own time. That's what the main skill that they really need to learn. Right. And asking them if, if we know that we need to leave by a certain time or that I need you off in order to give your brother a turn or whatever at a certain yeah. time, how do you want me to then approach you? Do you want a five minute warning, a 10 minute warning? Are you going to be in charge with a timer? How's that yeah. going to work? Because then you know that the argument hopefully then won't happen because you've already have a pre-plan. Yeah, and exactly. And so what my son always did uh, was he would, and, and we had plenty of, you know, terrible arguments. Yeah, over. yeah you have to have a blowout or two, right? You have yeah. to. And so, um, you know, he really struggled with, um, with his self-regulation and, and, I cannot tell you how, I mean, this was super challenging around the time when he was 16 and 17, he's 18 now. Um, but he would, he would say to me, I need help. I can't, mm. I'm, I'm not doing the things I want to be doing because I can't stop playing this one video game. Um, and so. And you can't you just know. be like, well, you should just stop then. Exactly. You can't, you can't, right? Like, I mean, that's, but that is a knee jerk reaction of many parents, right? I mean, we've all been there. Where we're right. like, oh, well, if you don't like it, like, just stop. Right. But that doesn't exactly. work that way. Or, right. you know, maybe you could do the things that you want to do first or that you need to do first and then use your video game time as, like, dessert. Mm -hmm. um, it was really hard because, you know, 16, 17-year-old, even 18 is really 
you know, they, they're all, you know, they, their brains are all tied into yes. the reward, you know, that they're getting. And, and also I think, especially with boys, that kind of, um, the thrill seeking. Oh, sure. the They've got emotions and hormones and yeah. endorphins and things flying all over the place. And by Absolutely. The way, and very importantly, all kids turn to media because it's way more it's it's more of again it's that peer validation mm -hmm. that they're really seeking during adolescence so a lot of parents will say to me well my 13 year old son used to be like the best kid in the world he would you know snuggle with me da 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 and do all his homework and now all he wants to do is play video games part of the reason why kids start turning to media is not because they're addicted uh, even though there are some studies that show that you know, there's some brain stuff going on, they're turning away from their parents because they want to be involved in other stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we also do need to recognize that oh, some of this is developmental, right. that your their friends on Snapchat are, that's their whole life. That's right. You know, that is, that is not the cyber life. It is just life. Life yes. as they know it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, as parents, we need to help we need to understand that and not, you know, feel like your kid is, a, you know, rejecting you or, or, or dismissive of you, but um, we need to help them self-regulate through that period. So what was the answer for your kid? I mean, how did you, did he, he's asked for help. So how did you help him self-regulate in that situation? So we helped him by, um, he would set a timer. Oh, good. Um, the timer's and, great. Yeah. Yeah. He would do his kid set the kitchen timer. And then he would, when it would go off, he would run upstairs and set it for 15 minutes more. Um, and hmm. then, um, okay. <laughs> so, and then we also used a few different types of, um, parental controls. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that we liked is called open D as in dog N as in Nancy S as in sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, so open DNS is a uh, program that does allow you to set time limits. And it also allows you to um, restrict uh, content from uh, certain domains, That's like, um, yeah, like anything with drugs or anything with sex or anything, mm -hmm. you know, all the vice related <laughs> domains. Um, these parental, so we use parental controls. Um, but what I recommend to parents is to understand that kids uh, can defeat them very easily. Um, so he, well, he we, was on board, though, at least, right? Oh, I mean, if he well, was on the board. problem was he was asking us for help, and then he really would, and then he would go in and, and defeat the parental. Sort of he, sabotage really, himself. Yeah, yes, yeah. exactly. And and again, yeah, that's a problem. These are all modern problems that we're dealing with mm -hmm. in digital age. So so interesting. You know, he, and it was one of the things that was so interesting was how honest he was about it once mm -hmm. we caught doing it. I mean, he was like, oh, yeah, you can basically Google instructions on how to do this. Yes, and I did it. Absolutely. And he was like, and he was like enjoying this game of cat and mouse that we're all playing. Um, you know, we would set the parental controls based on what he wanted. And then he would go in and figure out how to get around them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids with very like meager tech skills can do this. Right. Right. Um, Google so has got the, all the answers then. <laughs> yeah. So it, again, it's, you know, just still working on it. And as he matured, he was able to manage, you know, he, he managed his, learned to manage his time better. Right. Um, and actually today, um, he was just, he's 18, like I said, and, and uh, he was making plans with his friends to, to get together and trying to give directions to someone about where they were going to meet up. And I said, well, why don't you use Snap Maps? And so Snap Maps is this thing in Snapchat that allows you to see your friends on a map, mm -hmm. their location. And my son goes, oh, I deleted Snapchat. Mm. And I'm just like, oh, victory. Yes. And like, nice. <laughs> and, his, and his friends are like, yeah, dude, you know, get rid of it. You know, like now they're like, they're kind of over it. So what I would say to parents is even if you do go through troubling times about your kids, um, you know, media involvement, if you work with them and keep plugging away, they get to an age when they realize it's not uh, productive and, and it's running counter to their own goals. Mm, good to know. And, and that there's, there's hope out there that <laughs> we can get through it. Tell us what tips that you have for parents who want to really ensure that their children have a healthy relationship and experience with media. What, what are some specific tips that you would have? 
Well, I think number one is to understand that kids are really watching what you do. So um, be, try and be a good digital role model for your mm -hmm. kids and mm -hmm. show them that you're able to set limits for yourself. Um, and also explain what you're doing when you're doing it on your phone or on your laptop or whatever. So they don't just think that it's, you know, you're all constantly just on your phone. So what I say is, you know, you can say like, I need to make this call for work now, but after I make this call, I'm going to be done with my work stuff and then we can do something else. So mm -hmm. it, that's just one example. Um, so be a good digital role model. I do think that parents should really try to set up some, we say screen free times and zones mm -hmm. in the home. Um, like the, the dinner car. table, right? I dinner mean, we, yeah. we, we were yeah. very strict about that as well. Yeah, put the phones away, and parents have to put the phone away. Absolutely, too. absolutely. Uh, yeah, so so that, you know, and you can also think of it as sort of sacred spaces, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. The bedroom, that's a sacred space. That's super hard for parents to do, because I know a lot of parents like to check their email before they go to bed. But, mm -hmm. you know, you have to impose those rules on yourself, too. And then I think that, you know, in addition to choosing quality media, uh, enjoy media with your kids. Mm -hmm. So you know, uh, share your favorites that you had. It's easy to do on streaming now with, uh, so much revival of some of the, Oh, it's so stuff. classic. Yes, I agree. Uh, it's really fun. you know, so you can watch like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, eight is enough or, you know, whatever. Right. Uh, right. Uh, <laughs> eight is enough. <laughs> and, and it's so fun. And then you can, sh you can go, wow, you know, the pacing is really different and talk about the different things that you're, that you're noticing in the shows. So share media with them. Yes. I love to actually read with my daughter, like yeah. some of the classics and then watch, you know, the movie, whether oh, it's awesome. like, whether it's, whether we're reading about Helen Keller and watching the miracle worker or, you know, reading about Anne of Green Gables and watching, you yeah. know, Anne on TV yeah, or any of those. Yes. It's yeah. like, it's, it's so much fun to do that. I love that. And she actually <laughs> came in yesterday and she was singing, uh, Mary Poppins and, <laughs> And we were talking, I said, oh yeah, we, we still haven't read the, we haven't um, seen the movie yet. She had just seen the theater play. She's like, well, uh -huh. mom, you know, the play and the book are clearly going to be better than the movie. You know, she's speaking like me because uh, I'm trying great. to go, yeah. make sure you do this before you watch the movie. Right. Yeah. Oh, you know, and a good example too is Harry Potter, yes. you know, um, because, and now it's funny because my son grew up with the Harry Potter book. So we were always waiting for the next one to come out, but now they're all there. Yes. Uh, so you can really binge them. <laughs> yes, I know. As soon as we start that, like, you know, my son is just turned seven, my daughter's eight right. and a half. And I'm like, I know we're getting ready to start. And you just, once you get started, like that's going to be how it is for a while. So it's yeah. like a commitment. It's Harry Potter world. Yeah. So, yeah, so that would be my third thing is just kind of try to enjoy it together. Yes. And, um, I as you're enjoy, as you're watching it together, you can stick in some of your, some of your messages to your kids. Just don't ruin the show, but you know, you can say, well, I liked it when they, when that kid, um, in the, in the movie or whatever, in the video game, you know, stood up for somebody else, mm -hmm. even if he knew, you know, that, that people would criticize him for it or, right. you know what I mean? You can, you can, you can, um, just basically reiterate, um, some of the positive messages that you see to your kid. Right. So if there is a kid sitting in front of you, your child, and you want to somehow have a conversation about media, it's like, you know, they, they've, they've been, say, wanting to watch a new show. Maybe you don't think it's going to be so great. Or, you know, you they, they want to kind of expand their horizons in certain ways. How sure. can you sit down with your child and talk to them about why you have the values that you have while they're trying to sort of challenge them? Like, what kind of words would you say? Maybe they want to watch something violent and, and you don't want them to. Or their friend has a phone and you don't want them to get it. But, like... How do we relay to them, here's how we came up with this, and, and you know, still make them feel heard? Well, I will just say that I think that at the end of the day, as parents, it is our responsibility to just say no sometimes. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. <laughs> you know, you can say, like, you can't see it until you're 13, or you can't play that video game until you're 13. I mean... And they go, I'm, oh, mom, oh, yeah. dad. Yeah. They... <laughs> 
really are looking to us to set limits. And it doesn't always feel good for parents. I mean, it's super hard because we are in this world. And, and everything I've said is very much child-centric and helping them to, you know, really feel heard, like you said, and validated and understand their developmental stages. I mean, I think you can always say, like, at the end of the day, you know, one of the biggest areas where this comes in is right around the tween years when a 10, 11, and 12-year-olds want to see um, movies that are like the um, PG-13. Yes, PG-13. Yes. Yeah, so, and it's like such an ambiguous um, age rating, and parents are like, you know, because it could get the PG-13 for sex. It could get it for violence. It could get it for... Language, you know, yes. Exactly. And we had this problem right around the time when my son, I believe was 12, when Avatar came out. And Avatar had some sex and a lot of violence. And But it was like the Academy Award winning movie. And, you know, so... Oh, I think sure. It, yeah, I think he saw it at age 12. But I delayed it as much as possible. Um, and I, and so I would say, try and delay if you're really not into it and say, you know, I know that your best friend is seeing it, but I think it's too violent. So you can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, and then, or you, you know, another good trick is to bribe your kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big proponent of, uh, it, but don't let them know you're doing it. So you can say, well, um, let's see, finish your report for school or whatever it is that you want them to do. And then, you know, and then we'll talk about it. No, then um, we'll talk about it. You may not even get yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You can yeah. have a discussion so, yeah. at that point. <laughs> so it's just a delaying tactic. Um, and then I think, you know, sometimes you just have to say, you know, I I, I know that that's what your friends are doing, but I, I'm not into it. And so I'm going to say no. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, you have to delay because you want to research it yourself. You don't even right. know. Um, I've heard that a lot around... 13 reasons why, like the parents really wanted to oh, watch it first, you know, before, yes. and we interviewed somebody, um, Dr. Day Sheridan about that and, and how to talk to kids about 13 reasons why and sexual assault and bullying. And yes. you, know, she, it, it, you want to watch it first. And then she recommends that, like watch it first and then see if it's right for your kid and then watch it with your kid because, yeah. you know, some of the, some of the programs have to do with that. Like, all right, I'm going to let you watch it but I want to watch it with you so you can watch it, but not over at your friend's house. You got to watch it with me. So I, I, I think sometimes you have to put parameters around it. If you're planning on allowing your child to watch it and it's sort of questionable in your mind. Yes, I completely agree with that. And that's, um, you know, and it, that really goes for anything, even mm -hmm. if it's a video game, you know, like as I know a lot of parents aren't into video games, but but, um, you know, again, this comes up when ki when kids sort of switch from, um, you know, e-games, which are everyone, it's okay for everyone, mm -hmm. to t-games, which are for teens, right, you know, which right. do have more violence. And you can say, uh, okay, right around that switch time, I'm going to just check it out first. You know, there's a lot of demos online you can see of these video games. Um, they even playthroughs, even demos that have playthroughs that are small. So you can check it out, test it out, and then say, well... When we open it up, when we download it or whatever, you're going to show me how, how to do it. And you're going to show it to me. That's a really That's neat a idea. I, my husband is connected very much with my kids by bringing them to a new place that opened up not too far from our house that has old video games. Like oh, playing Center, Centipede and Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man and, you know, uh, uh, Space Invaders. And he's right. in his glory. And he's like, no, this is a video game. Um, and my kids think it's very cool, too. So that works out. Uh, so sometimes you can connect on video games and just bring in some of the oldies as well and, uh, and and then you know maybe allow your kids to to bring in some of the new ones too and I like the idea of of being able to have your child watch you know watch with you and maybe do it with you and show me you know take the lead and show me what's going on so I we've come to the point of the interview where I want to ask you for the top tip now, what is the the crucial tip that you would want people to take away after listening to this podcast? I guess my top tip would have to be really keep the lines of communication open. And that means talking to your kids about media and technology early and often. Mm -hmm. um, the conversation about technology and media, it's, it's never over. You know, it's, no. it's ongoing. Um, and the, 
the expectations and rules are going to change as your kids grow and mature. So, you know, if parents will ask me like, well, what do I do? I want my three year old loves YouTube. You know, what do I do? So some of these things we've talked about watching together, maybe checking out the content or, you know, first, but really engaging your kid in conversation. And you can say, well, we can watch it, but afterwards I want to talk about it. Or I want you to think about these, about something when, when we're watching it together. So just establishing that communication. And that means that when your kids really do start having their own interests and, and making their own choices and having that ability to, you know, really do, you know, do very powerful things with their technology, they have a foundation um, where they know that you are involved and they know that you're on board with technology and media and that, and that they can come to you and talk to you about it. Right. So just having the lines of communication open and asking open-ended questions to your kids, you know, without, without judgment, because again, it is their world. Yes, it's their world. And sometimes you really need to be part of that world and to understand it, not just say no to it, but really become part of it so that your kids can keep that communication open and can say, you know what, we played this together and here's the area that I didn't like. And here's the things that I'm concerned about. And here's the things that I really thought were kind of cool. You know, otherwise, we don't know. You know, we just are saying no to something that we're really not aware of. So that's uh, right. I think and that's the best important. thing about conversation is it's completely free. Yes. You know, as your kids are growing up, the, you know, you're going to find out that, kid, that, that, you know, technology companies are always going to try and sell you on parental controls and just $5 a month that you can monitor every single thing your kid does and all of that kind of stuff. But the thing about having those conversations with your kid, even if they're, when they're really just starting to investigate technology at three and four years old, it's conversation, and that is free. I love that. I, I say I say that parenting is the ultimate do-over. Conversations, you're never going to have one big talk, but a series of little ones. And, and that's what we want because obviously the kids are going to keep growing and experiencing life and getting more and more information and have more and more questions. And the more that we can answer them and also pose some of our own so that they're thoughtful about it, then we're giving them some processing, right? They're able to say, oh, I'm going to step back and I want wonder what my parents would think of this and what do I think about it? You know, do right. I like what I'm seeing? So can you tell us if people wanted to get more information about you or Common Sense Media or any of the things that you were talking about, what would be the resource of the week? Where would you like people to go? Uh, well, where I want people to go is um, to a section on our website uh, where we have what we call parent concerns. Mm. So a lot of people know Common Sense Media from our, mainly the movie reviews, which are awesome. They are. They uh, really are. It's true. Yeah, so they'll tell you everything you need to know. But And the, and all of our reviews are, are great um, because we give everything an age rating based on our independent judgment and a quality rating um, based on, you know, our, our expert judgment um, about media. But if you go to Common Sense Media dot org slash parent concerns you'll find that we have resources uh, what we've done a they're basically faqs so q so you know q a style answers to a huge range of issues both things that are media issues that have an impact on kids for example violence and also um things that kids are doing with media and, and how they're interacting with it such as cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge range of things. And we cover even we have reading tips, we have tips about managing back to school, we have things about, you know, helping kids, um, you know, understand, um, you know, the, the body image messages that they get from media. Right. Um, so I would just recommend that you go to parent concerns and investigate some of those answers, because we have so many things that a lot of parents have already thought of, but they may not know that we have a resource for that. Well, this has been so informative, and I know I was just speaking to um, one of my very best friends today about the fact that I was going to be interviewing you, and she said, oh, my goodness, I use them all the time for their movie reviews. I like to be able to look at something that's not going to judge me, but give me the information that I need and tell me, 
here's, you know, here's what's in the movie and now you make your decision. And I think that's what Common Sense Media is all about. Just giving us the information so that we can make a good judgment for our families and then take that information and plug it in really easily without, without having to do all the, the labor work ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And I'll just say one more thing, which is a little bit of a plug. Um, but we're doing a campaign right now to um, to uh, fund our upcoming reviews of shows that are on YouTube. Mm. So YouTube, as you know, is super popular. And then they also have a subscription service where um, you need to um, pay a monthly fee to get access to some of their shows. And that's called YouTube Red. So you know, YouTube shows are just as uh, important and becoming as popular as other, you know, TV shows, just as streaming really becomes uh, so common. Mm -hmm. So we're running a campaign right now where you can actually donate to become a member of our of our uh, nonprofit. And then you can donate and then you'll have an advance um, be able to see our YouTube reviews um, in advance of when everybody else can see them. And so I would just love to put a plug in there if, if it makes it onto the podcast. For oh, well, I think so that's absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. <laughs> Who doesn't want to know more about that? Exactly. So we're going to be doing ratings just as we do for movies with YouTube stuff. I, I think that's great and extremely progressive. The more that we have the information, the better off we are. I think it helps to calm the anxiety that sometimes comes with parenting in this media world. So thank you so much for all of your great information today, including the information on YouTube that you just gave and the information about your website and parenting concerns. I love all the information you provided. I love that you are non-judgmental in providing the information that we need. And I also think your tips are very timely, extremely important, and help us to really have the conversation that we need rather than simply saying no to our child and shutting off and shutting the door to the important conversations we need to have. So thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. Well, I've got my takeaways and sweet friends, I know you have yours. Let's discuss them. Come up on Facebook. Let's go to Dr. Robin Silverman's page or let's chat about it at drrobinsilverman.com or twitter.com slash drrobin. And of course, you should go to commonsensemedia.org. And if you love this podcast like I did, would you kindly go up to iTunes, rate, review it, share it, love it. We want more people to hear about this so that more people get some solutions that they've been needing from Common Sense Media, from all the other wonderful interviews we've done. I'd really, truly appreciate it. It makes an incredible difference. Thank you. We have no more time for today, but my fellow parents, leaders, and educators, I'm so glad you tuned in to How to Talk to Kids About Anything. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com. So many great podcasts are on there, show notes. I look forward to weathering the storms and enjoying the sunny side of life together. And please remember, even on the days when you fall short, you know we all have those days. You've got this. You're here. You're getting the information you need. I know it's not easy, but never forget there's always tomorrow. Parenting is the ultimate do-over. I'm right there with you. And as there are moments when we doubt our know-how, our choices, and our sweet, sweet sanity, please know you are 10 times the parent you think you are. You really are. Until next time, this is Dr. Robin Silverman with How to Talk to Kids About Anything. Please tune in again and keep connecting through conversation. See you next week. You've been listening to How to Talk to Kids About Anything with Dr. Robin Silverman. For more information on books, articles, speaking engagements, or curriculum, please visit drrobinsilverman.com.